Science versus politics and the US president. Hello, I'm Arlen Maido and this is The Heat. In a stunning public rebuke, President Donald Trump on Wednesday rejected the professional scientific conclusions of his own government about the prospects for a widely available coronavirus vaccine and the effectiveness of masks in curbing the spread of the virus. This new political storm is brewing as the death toll in the United States climbs to nearly 200,000. Well, there is much to talk about. Let's get straight to our panel. Dr. Gary Morsh is a family and emergency physician and the founder of COVID Care Force. He joins us from Kansas City, Missouri. With us from New Jersey is Dr. Paul Offit. He's a pediatrician and the director of the Vaccine Education Center at Philadelphia's Children's Hospital and a professor of pediatrics and vaccinology at the University of Pennsylvania. And joining us uh, right here in Washington, D.C. is the senior news editor at U.S. News and World Report, Joseph Williams. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Joseph, let me start with you, and we have a new political storm that's erupted over a vaccine, a possible vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, that came after the director of the Centers for Disease Control, Robert Redfield, said a vaccine could be available in limited supplies between November and December. And he said limited supplies because the first batch is likely to go to healthcare workers. Um, the majority of Americans, he said, would probably get that vaccine uh, probably in the second or third or even fourth quarter of 2021. Well, President Trump was unhappy with that because it doesn't fit in with his timeline. He wants a vaccine before the election on November 3rd. Now let's listen to the two of them. Dr. Robert Redfield first. I think there will be vaccine that initially be available sometime between November and December but very limited supply and will have to be prioritized. If you're asking me when is it going to be generally available to the American public so we can begin to take advantage of vaccine to get back to our regular life, I think we're probably looking at third, late second quarter, third quarter, 2021. I think he made a mistake when he said that. It's just incorrect information. And I called him. And he didn't tell me that. And I think he got the message maybe confused. Maybe it was stated incorrectly. No, we're ready to go immediately as the vaccine is announced. And it could be announced in October, could be announced a little bit after October. So, Joseph, what do you make of that? I mean, is uh, the vaccine and the development of the vaccine, is politics going to get in the way of that? Why not? <laughs> it's 2020. Politics is getting in the way of almost everything. I mean, the, the frustrating part here is that uh, you're, the, the president is asking you to him, the, the president, uh, 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 a businessman turned politician, he's asking you to believe him over the word of a man who has had background in science, who has spent his whole career in science, and who runs what many people consider to be the gold standard in public health. I mean, countries around the world look to the CDC for guidance on various things. Uh, so it, to me, it, it's not very surprising at all that the president would ask people to believe him and not the scientist because this has been the pattern all along. I mean, uh, President Trump has been uh, fighting with the scientific community almost since he became a presidential, uh, uh, presidential public figure. And this is, no, this is no different. I think what he has ho here, however, is a couple of problems. The first is that, yes, there could be a vaccine by uh, October, November. But uh, by all accounts, by, by accounts not only from, from scientists but from people in his own administration, first responders are going to be prioritized. Uh, second is the problem of logistics. Even if you get a good vaccine uh, going, it's going to take a while to manufacture enough to distribute across the country to people beyond the first responders. But the third problem, third most interesting problem here, is an opinion poll has recently come out that suggests some 70% of Americans do not want to take the virus because they feel the process has been rushed. Uh, they feel like it might not be safe and that they want other people to be the guinea pigs other than themselves. So on that front, at the very least, in, in terms of talking to the population, President Trump has a very tough sell to make getting people to take a, vac a vaccine that he says is going to be ready sooner rather than later when science says otherwise. That's right. There's been a lot of skepticism about the development of a vaccine in the next few months. Uh, Dr. Paul Offit, what is your view on what it would take to get a vaccine to market? And do you think the way in which this is being done right now, it's become so politicized that that 
politics get in the way, getting in the way of this will, will hurt that effort rather than help it. Well, if politics gets in the way of vaccines, we're really in trouble. I, you know, we, we've uh, if this this cannot be hydroxychloroquine. This cannot be convalescent plasma. In which case, politics really did get in the way. I mean, we have to make sure that these phase three trials, these large prospective placebo-controlled, roughly thirty thousand person trials, go to completion or go to at least to the point where there's clear, statistically significant, robust evidence that it works, that it works in all the groups in whom you're initially going to, to put it out there, and that it's safe in all the groups in whom you're initially going to give it to. So um, that has to happen. I, and I do think maybe I'm, I'm an optimist, but I mean, you do have data safety monitoring boards that, at my understanding, have been charged with, with treat this as you would any vaccine, and also the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. If it goes through that committee, I'm, I'm on that committee. Um, though, though that committee is composed of academics that, that are not associated with the government, that are not associated with uh, the pharmaceutical industry, that have no pressures other than trying to make sure that the American public gets vaccines that are safe and effective. So it'll be harder to politicize this, frankly. And if it is politicized, I mean, if you have an FDA advisory committee, vaccine advisory committee that's, that is hesitant about this vaccine, and then you try and, and put it out there, you're going to have a lot of people standing up and saying, I wouldn't get this vaccine. People who, who people like Tony Fauci or Francis and I think the, 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 this would not work well for the administration. And Paul, just in terms of the science of this, have we ever seen a vaccine get to market so quickly? Well, so the fastest vaccine ever made was the mumps vaccine. The, the strain of virus was isolated in 1963. It became a vaccine in 67. But there weren't 100 companies making a mumps vaccine. And there weren't, you know, there wasn't all this money serving as a pull mechanism. Basically, what's happened is that the government and, and other private philanthropic organizations like the Gates Foundation have taken the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies. They said, we'll pay for the phase three trials. We'll mass produce this at risk. No company would ever do that. So uh, that's why it's so fast. But it, that's OK, as long as we have a phase three trial like the ones we're talking about. These are typically sized phase three trials. The human papillomavirus vaccine was a 30,000 person person trial. The conjugate pneumococcal vaccine was a 35,000 person trial. So th th this is OK as long as you let it go to completion. If if this administration reaches their hand into the warp speed bucket, pulls out a couple of vaccines and says, we think this is good enough, I think it would be a disaster because vaccines and hygienic measures, those two things are our way out of this. And if you scare the American public with an ineffective or unsafe vaccine, then you've lost a really important way of ending this nightmare. Uh, Dr. Gary Morsh, I'm going to ask you about the uh, safety, and that, well, that's another controversy that's brewing, about the safety of masks. But first, let me get your thoughts on the development of a vaccine. Well, I, we're all waiting for a vaccine, but I think we all, all the panelists agree, uh, politics has really, uh, uh, really hijacked this whole process, unfortunately, and I'm, I'm like the, uh, the others uh, tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical that uh, even if we if we don't rush the process, even if uh, even if we get the right vaccine, we have just uh, polluted the 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 atmosphere, the the public opinion in this country, uh, and people are so anti-vaccine now. Uh, it's it's a really sad that a an effective vaccine might be available, but Americans are not going to want to want to get it. Right. Yeah, and uh, as I uh, asked a moment ago, there is, as I said a moment ago, that there is another controversy brewing over the use of masks um, between Dr. Redfield and the president. Let's listen to them again. Mm -hmm. well, these actually, we have clear scientific evidence. They work, and they are our best defense. I might even go so far as to say that this face mask is more guaranteed to protect me against COVID that when I take a COVID vaccine. The masks have problems too. And I talked about the masks have to be handled very gently, very carefully. Uh, I see that in restaurants there are people with masks and they're playing around with their mask and they have it, their fingers are in their mask and then they're serving with plates. I mean, I think there's a lot of problems with masks. Now, vaccine is much more effective than the mask. So there again, you have President Trump who is uh, saying something that the scientist has just said it's completely different. We heard Dr. Redfield there say that in many instances, masks could be a better thing than vaccines. The president's saying something completely different. Right. Well, uh, you know, I work with the Native American uh, communities around the United States, and the reason the incidents, the positivity rates are, are, are plummeting in our Native American communities is because the people, the, the Native Americans are following the lead of their leaders, of their chairman, of their tribal chiefs, of their presidents. They're wearing masks. 
they're, they're doing the right thing. And uh, it's, it's sad, a sad day in America when, when people won't follow science. Paul, you wanted to say something? Yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, it, it's, I mean, I was, I was on service at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia last week, and we have a number of patients in our hospital who have, are infected with COVID-19. If you gave me the choice of one or the other, a mask or a vaccine, I would choose the mask every time. Because when you wear a mask, what you're doing is you're making it very difficult for those small droplets to, you know, to enter your, you know, your nose or mouth, because you've covered it with this two-layer mask that should preclude all entrance of, of, of those, those particles. And also, the, the, in addition, if you stand, you know, Far, you know, far away, like six feet away, for example, that also makes it difficult for those small particles to travel six feet. So, so basically, the choice is this. If you walk into a room with someone who has COVID-19, or if you're exposed to somebody who's asymptomatically infected, then you don't know it. Here's your two choices. You could wear a barrier that protects you from getting those small droplets from entering your nose and throat, or you could say, forget the mask. I will let those small particles enter my nose and throat, and then I will assume that, that this vaccine is going to be so effective that it's going to protect me against disease, where all of us who are in this are, would be happy with a vaccine that's 75 percent effective against moderate to severe disease, which means that 25 percent of the, the people who are, who are infected, who are exposed to the virus, who've been vaccinated, could get moderate to severe disease. Which do you want? I mean, it, the, the best prevention is to not even be infected, not to let yourself get infected and then see whether or not the vaccine works. Uh, Dr. Redfield is right. President Trump is wrong. The mask is the better way to go. Right. When it comes to masks, well, as you've just put it there, Paul, it's a no-brainer. Uh, Joseph, you know, when we look at this issue of masks, and it's not just on the issue of masks, on many other things concerning COVID-19, uh, the president has come out ahead of scientists. But if we take masks, um, why is this such a big issue for the president? I mean, where's the political fault lines along, uh, you know, uh, over the use of masks or not using masks? Well, if you'll forgive the American football analogy, uh, masks are like three yards in a cloud of dust. It's very, uh, it's, it's low tech, it's very uh, low cost, it's incremental, uh, and it's something that everybody can, can use, and it's very common. Uh, what the president is advocating in terms of a vaccine is like the Hail Mary play. It's like going long and scoring a touchdown in spectacular fashion and in, in winning the game as a hero. Uh, and for some reason, uh, there is a resistance on, you know, among a lot of the president's supporters to doing something that's very easy, very low tech, that they consider an impingement upon their freedoms. I mean, uh, Attorney General William Barr last night compared wearing a mask to slavery, which is absurd. Uh, they have people running through the airports, Trump supporters in red hats and in Trump t-shirts without masks, running through airports, running through restaurants, storming uh, Walmarts and Target stores you know, saying, hey, everybody, look at us. We're not wearing masks. We're going to be fine. But that's not the case. Science and the virus proves them wrong almost every time. Uh, we had a, a, just recently a report from Trump country uh, where, uh, Kansas, uh, where the Kansas City uh, Chiefs played football on Monday night and had fans in the stadium where a lot of other fans did, a lot of teams did not. One fan reported ill with COVID-19. Same thing in a congregation in Maine that was traced to some 60-odd uh, uh, virus infections because you have a, a, a wedding that was conducted by a minister who doesn't believe in masks. Uh, about half a dozen or so people got infected there. Yeah. I think one or two may have even died. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the spectacular and the flashy and the Hail Mary versus the very steady incremental that's boring. Uh, I think Trump is looking for a huge win because, frankly, he's got a huge problem on his hands, yeah. not the least of which is, is a lot of outbreaks are happening in red states. Yeah, those are Republican states, of course. Uh, Dr. Morsh, President Trump is also potentially uh, banking on a theory, and that theory is called herd immunity uh, to beat the virus. Here is an exchange between President Trump uh, and a news anchor on the United States television network, ABC. Let's listen to this. You were saying it was going to disappear. Uh, it is going to disappear. It's going to disappear. I Not still if say we don't it. take action, correct? No, I still say it. It's going to disappear, George. And it's probably going to go away now a lot faster because of the vaccine. It would go away without the vaccine, George. But it's going to go away a lot faster. It would go it. away without the vaccine? Sure. Over a period of time. Sure, with time. It goes and many away. deaths. And you'll develop, you'll develop herd, like a herd mentality. It's going, to be, it's going to be herd developed, and that's going to happen. That will all happen. But with the vaccine, I think it will go away very quickly. So, Gary, the president there was talking about herd mentality. 
which is herd immunity, uh, I think he was referring to. But firstly, what is herd immunity, and does the president have any point here? Well, the president has what he thinks are points, but uh, not, not based on any kind of science, science or scientific uh, evidence. Uh, I don't think we know enough about uh, the COVID immune response to really be able to say whether herd immunity is, is something that we can count on. Uh, certainly in a lot of other uh, uh, viral illnesses, uh, it's, uh, it, it is something that, uh, that public health experts uh, follow, and some of your panelists uh, will know much about, uh, more about than I do. Yeah. But uh, let's hope, let's hope. But uh, it only time will tell. We have to wear masks, we have to social distance, and we need to take a vaccine, get that vaccine when a safe one is out. Paul, uh, one other question on that is the uh, number of children who've been infected by the coronavirus. Uh, one report says, a new report, this is that up to half a million children have been infected in the United States. Uh, the report also says that children really get the disease. They may have the virus, but they don't get the disease. But how concerned are you that people may get some kind of false uh, security in that? Because children, of course, can pass the virus onto their parents or even grandpa and grandma who are m far more vulnerable. Right, and, and they can get the disease and die from the disease, albeit rarely. So, so children in the United States make up about 26 percent, or this, this study was anyone less than 21, made up 26 percent of the U.S. population, yet only accounted for 0.08 percent of the deaths. So that is reassuring. Children do get infected less frequently, and when they get infected, they get infected less severely, but they certainly can spread the virus. And, and well, just one thing to get, get back to the issue of herd immunity, mm -hmm. name a virus that has been eliminated by natural infection. There is none. I mean, smallpox was eliminated because of a vaccine. Yeah. We eliminated yeah. measles in this country because, because ultimately we had a vaccine. There has never been a, a, an example where natural immunity has caused the virus to go away. And, and I don't think this is going to be the first example of that. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. We need to take a break right now. When we come back, we'll turn to Latin America, the region most affected by COVID-19. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat. CGTN. Welcome back. With about 8.4 million cases and over 314,000 deaths, Latin America holds the dubious title of the region most affected by the pandemic. Death rates continue to rise in parts of Mexico, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Bolivia, and Argentina. This, as the World Health Organization warns, the region is starting to reopen too soon. For more, we turn now to Dr. Marcos Espinal. He's the Director of Communicable Diseases at the Pan American Health Organization. That's the WHO's regional office for the Americas. Dr. Espinal, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Let's start with that warning from the WHO that the region is starting to reopen too quickly. What can you tell us about that? Are political leaders in the region just not heeding the advice of the WHO? Well, I think the region started earlier to, um, to with uh, mitigation measures, and uh, and we have to take into account that there is uh, is not only about um, advice, but it's also how the economies are doing, how the population is doing, the fatigue, and also in Latin America and the Caribbean, we have a high uh, rate of informal economy, uh, cities highly populated with belts of poverty. So it makes it more difficult, uh, the lockdowns and so on, for a longer time. Uh, but indeed, uh, some countries did reopen uh, uh, a little bit earlier. Let's go back seven months uh, to the first time a COVID-19 case was diagnosed in Latin America. And if we look at the situation today, uh, Brazil, Peru, Mexico, Colombia, and Argentina account for half of the top 10 countries in total coronavirus cases. Why have numbers got so high in Latin America? 
Well, it's a, it's a combination of factors, you know. I, I mentioned some of them, but uh, let me add others. You know, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is the highest of the WHO regions in terms of inequalities. A uh, group of people uh, living in situation of vulnerability. We heard earlier in the pandemic uh, what was going on in Manaus and the Amazon forest with indigenous uh, people but also uh, people, uh, prisoners, uh, women and children, Afro-descendants. So uh, poverty is still in Latin America. While the economies grow, the distribution of the wealth is not really equitable. So uh, a series of factors in addition to those, um, uh, there is also, you know, we uh, early in the pandemic, we saw, you know, shortages of supplies and PPEs. So a combination of factors are, 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 are leading into this. Uh, and, 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 and that is the reason we always advise that we need to continue strengthening this and these measures and al always balance the reopenings uh, with the public health and the economic finance people. Yeah, you mentioned those factors. What about things like access to health care? That's the other issue. Um, uh, indeed, uh, um, you know, uh, the region is not yet investing in, in health as it should be. The Pan American Health Organization recommend at least 6% of the GDP to be in public investment on health. So, and, and, and most of our countries are not yet there, investing 2 and 3% of the GDP in uh, public investment. Um, 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 universal health is one of the flagships of, uh, of, of, of PAHO and one of the constant messages. So, access, not only coverage, but also access is it, really critical. And many people don't have access. Countries like Peru, with sometimes 50, 60 percent informal economy, um, well, it's a, it's a situation that is not easy. Uh, there, are, there are areas in Peru and, and Brazil that you need to access by plane. So um, uh, it's still not yet there in terms of universal as it should be for everyone. And of course, there are political challenges as well. Here in the United States, we have President Trump, uh, who's been denying the science uh, behind the coronavirus pandemic and also uh, ignoring advice on the use of masks. And uh, we also noticed that in Brazil with the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, and to some extent that's also happening in Mexico with the president there, Andres Manuel Lobrador. Um, what are these doing to your efforts to try and combat this pandemic? Um, well, you know, we we can all we we, we nobody can control what the head of state are saying. We we respect those, but the the reality is this virus doesn't respect uh, people. You know, a head of state has been affected. You know, prime minister of England, uh, president of Honduras, president of Brazil actually was uh, infected. So, um, I think the region is very resilient in uh, fighting epidemics. We had the, the experience of H1N1 before, Zika virus. And there is no doubt we're going to get out of this. But we need to be patient and, and implement the non-pharmaceutical measures while we wait for the medicines and the vaccines to be available to be introduced into the people. So, But um, uh, the health system needs to uh, continue um, uh, testing, improving the testing, improving the uh, availability of beds, and, and making sure also the private sector is on board, because Latin America has a very uh, buoyant uh, uh, private sector, and we need to make sure we're also uh, coordinate with them. Civil society is really powerful. It's an all society effort, and, and governments should not think it's only the, their responsibility. It's all of us' responsibility. But government is, is the most important, basically, because it takes uh, actions. But it's an all uh, uh, society responsibility to address this. But it's going to take some time. This virus is not going to go away tomorrow. There's another disturbing trend, and we heard this from the uh, regional director for the WHO, Carissa Etienne. She says that there are rising death rates in parts of Mexico, and these are similar to trends in Ecuador as well as Costa Rica. What's behind that? Well, the message is simply it's that uh, just related to what I said, that this virus will continue affecting people. You know, um, uh, there is also in some of the countries in the south, the winter is coming. Uh, some, some of them are winter, actually, um, in the south. And, 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 and this has, you know, uh, influence on us. We have the flu 
in some of these countries. Um, uh, I think it's a, it's a matter of, of going back to the combination of factors and, you know, and, and sometimes uh, letting our guards down. We should not let our guards down and continue uh, watching this virus and, and, and implementing the measures because, you know, when we think we're flattening the curve, we're not. Look at what is happening in European countries now. They are seeing a second phase of, of, of cases of COVID. So this is going to be, and, and given we mentioned the, the, the weaknesses of our health systems, uh, they have made a lot of strides, but still we're not yet there in being the ideal health system that needs to be there to, to cope with pandemics like this one. And the implementation of the international health regulations is really critical because this is a, a constant it should be sustained. I mean, the bottom line is investing in health. We need to uh, ensure increasing in investment of health. Now, getting back to the pandemic itself, what can you tell us about uh, testing in Latin America? How effective are the tests? Uh, are they reliable? Well, that's a good point. You know, uh, countries like, uh, for instance, uh, Peru at the beginning, they investing in a lot of uh, Venezuela also has invested in a lot of rapid testing antibodies that are, were not reliable uh, false positive false negative they were not even recommended so so uh, the testing has improved uh, PAHO has donated tests uh, PCR testing to almost all the countries of the region uh, in terms of uh, South America and, and the Caribbean and Central America uh, um, and testing in some of the countries not yet at the level it should be. There are good practices like Chile has an, an, an excellent testing program. Uh, Brazil is increasing, but Brazil also was late in, 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 in boosting testing. So um, we still need to continue testing because the best way to prevent a second wave of virus is massive testing available to everyone and a good tracking system for contacts. So, so it has its ups and downs, the testing, and hopefully the countries continue to increase uh, uh, testing availability for the people. Dr. Marcos Espinal, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.